We will now move to the motion before the House this evening. The motion is, this House believes religion remains the opiate of the masses. I look to Frank Frederick's Lineker College to open the case for the proposition. I'll instruct you with the wise words of Jal Jalal al-Din al-Bakhi, known as Rumi. Sit, be still, and be silent, for you are drunk, and this, this is the edge of the roof. It is a profound privilege to serve in the proposition of tonight's debate. A debate commenced by Karl Marx in 1843, when he wrote in a contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, I quote, Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world. And the soul of soulless conditions, it is the opium of the people. Perhaps one of the most quoted and misquoted postulations on religion, together tonight we wish to further an old argument for a new generation of skeptics and faithful alike. It's also my profound privilege to be addressing you all. And my fellow teammates have my veneration and admiration. Veneration for one, being the same age as my grandfather. <laughs> and admiration for the other as a leading activist in tumultuous times. Furthermore, it is my divine duty to introduce the opposition. First of all, Gabe Rusk is a master's student in religion. He is both the LGBTQIA plus officer at the union, as well as the international grad officer for the Oxford Student Union. And he actually has real debate experience, so I expect nothing other than utter brilliance from you this tonight. Please welcome him. Also, I'd like to welcome Sheikh Dr. Usama Hassan, who is a senior researcher at the Killiam Foundation, a think tank specializing in human rights and counter-extremism. He's a trained imam, and he has argued in favor of the compatibility between Islam and evolution. Please welcome him. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to introduce the very reverend Professor Martin Percy. He is the Dean of Christ Church and a founding director of Lincoln Theological Institute. He's also the only li living theologian mentioned in the Da Vinci Code. So uh, tell him to be proud. Please welcome him. <laughs> it appears the opposition deemed it unnecessary to include, uh, include female voices. So I, I would like to assume that this is an ordinary decorum for those defending religion, but we'll just leave that be for now. <laughs> Mr. President, these are your guest speakers and they are most welcome. I want to tell you something about myself that I've never told anyone in this room. The autumn of my sophomore year of high school, I became ill. I began sleeping ten, 9, 10, even 11 hours every day. I began sleeping in class, which is maybe not surprising to you though who studied with me. <laughs> I even began falling asleep behind the wheel uh, while driving on my hour-long commute every day. After a trip to the doctor, rife with blood tests and examinations, the doctor began asking me a series of uncomfortable personal questions. Finally, he stated with confidence, I have determined your diagnosis, and he handed me a prescription for antidepressants. I was 16, and I was diagnosed as clinically depressed. In hindsight, I don't know what brought me to this place. Perhaps it was a succession of dramatic exits of people from my life. My mother moving to California, fathered by my sister being incarcerated, followed by my other sister running away. I was left living with my father, who was battling both sleep apnea and manic depression, leaving him worn out from having no sleep and adjusting to Zoloft. I felt alone. For those of you unfamiliar with the embrace of depression, it is not some great sadness. It is not a searing sting of a broken heart, nor the long sigh of a rainy day. Depression is the great nothingness that swallows your soul. It spits you out in the cold and vast empty universe and shrouds the light that's within you. It is not red nor blue, but an endless sea of gray. In that doctor's office, I had a choice. I could accept that I was a broken, purpose, uh, broken person in a purposeless world. Or I, I could follow that, and I know where that dark journey ends, and I've lost a friend there. I could also choose to believe that no matter how bad, how hard, how cold, how confusing that I can, I will, I must push on through. But this choice required essential belief in me. I had to believe that my suffering served a purpose. I had to believe that my life served a purpose. If I wasn't destined for greatness, I just needed to know I had a, a chance. 
When someone says opium, you probably think of Tom Wingfield taunting his mother with trips to the opium den from Tennessee Williams' The Glass Menagerie. But the proposition states that, quote, religion remains the opiate of the masses, and I believe this requires some description. Opiates are painkillers. You probably are actually more familiar with them than you realize. Codeine, oxycontin, hydrocodone, morphine. These are life-saving drugs that spare people from the incredible pain during times of their greatest need. I was once prescribed opiates after a tonsillectomy. Codeine, uh, I was on morphine during the surgery, and then after also uh, uh, Percocet. They're very powerful, but I'll tell you, one thing I'll never forget is one night I woke up after the drugs had worn off, and I had this searing pain so intense I couldn't even think. My throat was on fire as if I had swallowed lava. I know opiates are potent and potentially prone to abuse, but I honestly don't think I could have survived that week without them. Which brings me back to the moment in this doctor's office, holding this prescription. I made a choice. I, wa I walked out, I tore up the prescription, and I went to church. I went to church on Sunday, and then I went to youth group on Wednesday. I was driving 40 minutes each way, crossing a state, live, st crossing a state line, and I dove headfirst into the dirty baptismal. I joined Bible study and then worship team. I didn't feel any less broken, but at least I felt like I could feel whole for a moment even just a little. There was a man named Jesus who was born immaculately, loved radically, died horrifically, and rose miraculously just so I could feel whole. To be clear, I do not believe that religion can replace medicine, heal mental illness, nor is the answer for all social ills. But science is revealing the potent power of religion, religious beliefs in physical and mental health. Dr. Harold Koenig of Duke, of Duke University compiled 93 different studies that demonstrated that religious belief uh, lowers feelings of depression and anxiety. Other studies have suggested that a sense of spirituality leads to longer lifespans. In American Grace, sociologist Robert Putnam found that participating in religious community, regardless of belief, correlated with higher levels of civic engagement. Is religion an opiate for the masses? You bet it is. It was for me in my darkest days, and it is for 84% of the world who believes in faith, religion, or God, or spirituality. That's a billion people right now virtually everywhere. What's so important to note here is that religion doesn't have to be factually correct to be hugely powerful. You only have to believe it is. Whether I have a real relationship with a personal God, or I believe that there's a, a flying zombie, you know, named Jesus, however you want to describe it, I'm, I could just be simply experiencing the effects of cognitive biases, whether survivor's bias, the conjunction fallacy, confirmation bias, or even the aptly named halo effect. It works like a drug. You'll hear the opposition explicitly defend religion outright, positing that it is inherently a force for good in an otherwise fallen world. I know better and so do you. I've spent the last eight years leading World Faith, a global nonprofit focused on ending religious violence. I've seen the scars of a young survivor of the 2002 riots of Gujarat. I've spoken with a mother of an EMT who died at his ambulance when the second tower fell, fell on 9-11. I've borne witness to too much suffering caused by religion to say that it is inherently good. Moreover, goodness is not mutually exclusive to being an opiate. But I also ask you to listen keenly. I hope my fellow supporters of the proposition will abstain from the tired tirade of tyrants seeking to rid the world of religion. They may recount the silencing of women, abuse of children, and casualty of religious tyranny. But as a Christian myself, I know these criticisms hold true, but be not tempted by the narrative that seeks to banish religion to history with the same fervor of religious zealots. Let us not replace one conflict with another. Here is the fundamental truth. Religion is not inherently good nor bad. Like all social contracts from tribe to nation, culture to language, it can be a source of identity, meaning, and belonging. Similarly, opiates can help you heal or destroy your life. Both are a reflection of our human nature, shitty and beautiful, we are the problem and the solution. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Religion is not for everyone. Painkillers are for pain. But for many around the world, like you and like I, we struggle with the fact that we are simply a bag of meat stuck on this rock, flying through an endless space we call this universe. Like an opiate, religion helps us with the pain of the greatest uncertainty. Even Karl Marx knew this to be true. Just two sentences after the opium of the masses line, he shares, quote, 
To call them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up the condition that requires illusions. It's time that we separate what is prophetic from what is pathetic. This evening, you'll hear a procession of soundly articulated arguments for and against the proposition. Enjoy them, but hold not to them. Instead, I want you to remember this moment. I don't want you to just know. I need you to believe that religion is the opiate of the masses, for better or worse. Supporting the opposition is to deny my life-changing experience. Therefore, I ask you, I beseech you, I pray you, when you leave this chamber, join me in embracing religion as an opiate for the masses. Only then, in the spirit of Tikkun Olam, can we heal this broken world. Thank you for sharing this moment with me. Perhaps we've changed, but I hope after today, the world would never be the same. And with that, I will close as I have opened with Rumi. Out beyond the ideas of right and wrong, there is a field, and I will meet you there. Thank you.